Um, let me, I, I was way down, I was way down the far end of the line. I should have been on the other side of the wall, in fact. Um, I'm not part of the community gardening uh, program. I get invited to all sorts of uh, conferences. Um, in fact, you'd probably think I was an anti-gardener if you could see my uh, backyard. Uh, but I am a gardener of a different kind, and that is that I believe my role in life is cultivating people's imagination and raising the ceiling of the possible uh, for people. I want to introduce you to a notion of placemaking, uh, which I think can really enrich what you are doing within the community gardening uh, scene. Now, technical definition of placemaking. Placemaking is like homemaking. In homemaking, a homemaker takes a house and turns it into a home. Placemaking takes a space and turns it into a place. The Industrial Revolution changed the way that we see ourselves and the way that we view our world. Before the Industrial Revolution, the way that you would establish somebody's identity would be to ask them what two questions. Are you married? No, I said, <laughs> I said before the Industrial Revolution, not after. What do you do? Oh, that's what we ask now. What did they ask them? Okay, where do you come from? So what piece of land do you occupy? What clan do you and what clan do you belong to? So tribe and clan is what gave us our identity. Post the Industrial Revolution, what did we ask to establish somebody's identity? You've already all said it. What do you do? Now when somebody says to you, what do you do? What they are saying is, as a productive machine in the, this economy, what are the goods that roll off at the end of your production line? Uh, now, I deal a lot with city officials and the machine model. We not only began to see ourselves in machine terms, we began to look at our cities, um, our countryside, etc., through that same mechanistic machine model. Now, what placemaking does is really take us back to that time, that feeling of connection. To, to, to land and soil has been part of what gives us our identity. I said uh, a moment ago that what placemaking is, is is being like a homemaker. Well, it's a little more than that because it is literally being a homemaker in public space. What has happened over time is that, that, that people's identity, uh, even post the Industrial Revolution, when children were able to play in the street, adult, uh, elderly people would sit on um, seats in the street, etc., was that people's sense of home went out of their front door, out into the street, down to the corner store, down to the centre of the village. It was all their home territory. What has happened in our modern times is that that sense of home has been shrinking, 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 shrinking to the point where some people don't even feel like the front rooms of their own house is part of their home territory. So what placemaking is essentially is reclaiming that sense of home, that sense of place. All right. So I'm just going to tell you a series of stories, a little bit random, a little bit disconnected. All right. Can everybody see that? Can we turn the lights? Is it possible for somebody to turn the lights off for us? Nobody knows about that? Oh, we've got to start. Uh, this is a suitcase that I built many, many years ago, and uh, it, had a, it had a variety of lives, but this is what falls out of my suitcase. <laughs> Unbelievable, you say. Yes. Uh, and just for fun, I travelled all around the world setting my throne up in famous public spaces. And what intrigued me was how the public responded to my doing things like putting a throne in the middle of the Champs de Lys. Uh, everybody wanted their photograph taken on the throne. Um, now you'll notice here that I also dress up in royal robes and I have the scepter and a crown. Uh, and 
What's, I never ever asked anybody to sit in my throne. I was, this, these were all people who approached me. And what began to amaze me was the characters uh, who would insist on putting the crown on, taking the scepter, putting the robes on. Uh, this is a series of shots from London. You just look at the, the these are the most unexpected people uh, who have decided to sit in the seat. Now, I was... All right. <laughs> they were all men. I probably just put men in uh, because they probably considered a bit unlikely to do that. But think of it, it uh, probably was a majority of men. Now, I was decided to set my throne up in a deserted car park in Los Angeles. I chose this location because my father was an itinerant gospel preacher, so I think you can see the significance of the location. <laughs> Acres and acres of just tarmac in the middle of Los Angeles with this abandoned building sitting in the middle of it. A great spot to set my throne up, take a photograph of myself. I just arrived and I was starting to take the stuff out of the suitcase ready to set up when a police car rolled through the car park and they pulled up right beside me. There's nobody for miles around. They wind their window down and they say, Oi. No, they didn't say oi. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it, if anybody could do an American accent, uh, what are you doing? And I said, well, uh, I've got a th throne in a suitcase and I'm going to set the throne up and I'm going to take photographs of myself. And they said, well, you can't do it here. <laughs> Why not? They said, because this is where all the homeless people in Los Angeles sleep at the night time, and as soon as it gets dark, they're going to start filing in here, and you're not going to be safe. That very expensive camera gear, as sure as hell, isn't going to be safe. Uh, we urge you to pack up right now and get out. Now, I didn't. I didn't obey. And as soon as it got dark, they were absolutely right. Homeless people began to come into the car park. Can anybody guess what the homeless people wanted to do? <laughs> they wanted to sit on my throne and have their photograph taken. They weren't interested in stealing my very expensive camera gear. Now I'd shown this particular slide many, many, many times. And one day it kind of dawned on me, I've taken a picture of placemaking. See, here's this homeless lady, probably with all of her worldly goods parked in her lap. She's taken the scepter, she's put the crown on her head. And what has happened to her in that moment of time? Transformation. A transformation. She's gone from being homeless to the Queen of Los Angeles. Now what placemaking does, you see, what the Industrial Revolution did was in looking at ourselves as machines, we became obsessed with movement. We became obsessed with motion. Our cities are dominated with this whole concept that a stationary person, it, loitering is forbidden in many parts of the world because you're an unproductive machine. You should be moving. But what placeness does is actually stops us in our tracks, takes our focus off of a future destination. And when we become absorbed in the ever-present moment, an infinite array of possibilities opens up to us. A crack appears in the wall of our reality and through that crack we spy a potential for ourselves we never dreamed possible. Uh, I remember many years ago I ran a program for kids to get them walking to school and we got them to keep a, an account of the adventures they had and they had to make these adventure diaries. And when I would read these adventure diaries, this whole notion really struck home to me. Max and Rory are, are, are walking to school and they find a piece of rotten timber. So they put it on the gutter and they jump up and down on the piece of timber until it breaks. That was their adventure for the day. Now the thing is that we adults think of the trip to school in transport terms. We've got to move these kids from home to the school. And why are we sending them to school? Because they've got to get an education to become something. So the focus is all on about moving them to some destination as a means to getting them somewhere else. 
What place does, when Max and Rory became abs absorbed in jumping up and down on that piece of wood, they forgot that they were supposed to be going to school to get an education to become something. They became absorbed in that moment of time. We don't know, but there may have been two structural engineers conceived that day. <laughs> Every one of you developed your life's direction by some spontaneous event where you, were, where you got unfocused on what you were supposed to be doing and you became connected to the infinite possibilities that exist in the present moment. We don't know, but for this homeless lady on this evening, a future mayor of Los Angeles may have been conceived. Now I often ask my audiences about whether the chair is still in the Los Angeles car park. <laughs> Is it? It is in this lady's mind. Every time she comes home to bed down in her bed, she remembers the night some crazy guy from Australia arrived with a suitcase, set up a throne, and she got to be the Queen of Los Angeles. And when that memory resurfaces, the potential that goes with the mem memory also becomes like a beacon that calls her forth to some other destination. Placemaking is about creating memorable experiences that are potentially transformative. If you haven't created memories for people, you haven't really done placemaking, in my opinion. Some other quick lessons from this. Many people think that placemaking is all about design, creating great places. Placemaking is about creating events. Yes, it involves t uh, design. I was obsessed with the design of this chair for 12 months. I could think of nothing else for 12 months. So design was involved, but the design of the chair alone was not enough. It was the creation of an event uh, which became the act of placemaking. All right, I'm just going to tell you two more stories, and uh, I'm not sure what happens next, but anyway. Uh, this is a story that was told to me some time back, and I'm just going to kind of exaggerate and, and build on it a bit. And, and, uh, so the train pulls into a station and these two really elderly, I have to say really elderly because you know you might look at me and go, well he's elderly, so what, <laughs> I mean really, really elderly. People get onto the train, well shuffle onto the train I should say, more accurate. The train was overcrowded, there were lots of people on it and so a couple of people moved to allow these two elderly people to sit down. This was a train that was going between cities in Europe. And no sooner had the two elderly people got seated than the lady reaches into her bag and takes out two packages. She hands one to the elderly man. He slowly unwraps it and inside is a sandwich. He lifts the lid of the sandwich and he goes, in a very loud voice that the whole train could hear. Oh no, not fish again! <laughs> and the whole train went quiet, <laughs> wondering what on earth would happen next. And a teenager sitting opposite them says, leans over to him and says, I love fish. I've got a peanut butter sandwich, would you like to do a cha exchange? <laughs> so the peanut butter sandwich was swapped for the fish sandwich. And for the next hour and a half, these two were engaged in swapping stories about uh, and, and information between each other. So place is incredibly mobile. Place is a smile. Place is simply nodding to somebody. Uh, Place is spontaneous. We never know what will come out of these kinds of exchanges. I explained to the group yesterday that in our cities we are besotted with what I call the planned exchange. Our lives <coughs> seem to revolve around the planned exchange. But when you think about it, all of the significant events in life, and you as gardeners would know that this is vitally important, that, that evolution is driven by random events. Evolution is driven by chaos. 
and diversity. And in our cities, we are trying to plan our cities and order them and reduce the amount of conflict that goes on between those. But that's the very driver of the evolutionary process. What's been happening in our cities over time is that we have been taking a whole lot of exchanges that used to happen for free. Notice that the exchange between the elderly man and the young person with the sandwich happened while they were on a journey, a journey to a destination where they were obviously going to engage in a planned exchange of some kind. They wouldn't have got on the train if they weren't going somewhere for a planned exchange. What the, the exchange that happened on the train was probably far more important than the exchange they were actually travelling to at the far end. Um, we tend to have got our priorities really screwed up in our cities, uh, where we are so over-focused on the planned exchange and don't understand the value of the spontaneous or the unplanned exchange within our cities. The exchange of, of the lady on the seat was, was an entirely uh, spontaneous exchange. Um, I'm quite passionate about this from a, from a social justice point of view. Uh, I remember the first time I started to understand the way that cities work. Uh, I'd uh, been to Los Angeles for about three days, my first overseas trip. Um, and then I went to Groningen in the north of Holland. And for some reason I'd read my timetable wrong and I was only able to stay there for three hours. So I hired a bike at the train station and I madly rode around the city taking photographs. And when I sorted my photographs, I found that I had three photographs of people in wheelchairs, in bike lanes, engaged in social interaction. One was a blind man being taken for a walk with, by two young people. And I looked through all of the pictures I'd taken in Los Angeles and no wheelchairs in my pictures which led me to conclude that all the disabled people in Los Angeles have moved to Groningen in the north of Holland. <laughs> there was a time, for example, when elderly people would sit on benches in our neighbourhoods and swap yarns with each other and swap yarns with us, the, their accumulated wisdom, the street being the metaphor for the journey of life, they would sit at the crossroads and so when you had a big decision to make, you'd go to the crossroads, sit down with the elderly people and they would share their wisdom. That was a spontaneous exchange. They just sat out there waiting for you to rock up whenever you felt like it. You know, I've been here for three years, I know somebody's coming soon. <laughs> now when we don't allow that in the way that we structure our cities, what do we do? We replace it with a planned exchange. So we build them a senior citizens hall, we buy them a senior citizens bus, we bus them to the senior citizens hall where they can play bingo with each other or knit doilies. Replacing a lost spontaneous exchange, a uh, lost spontaneous exchange with a planned exchange. So there are incredible social justice and sustainability issues around how much our cities are structured to the um, planned exchange as opposed to the spontaneous exchange. I just want to tell you one other story, um, which he, as I grow older I suddenly realise how much of my life I have spent on means rather than on the ends. And let me explain that in a story form. Doug came back from the war uh, when he was just a young man and uh, the war had really affected his mind. And so he found himself homeless for about four years. And then he met uh, Elsie and Elsie helped him get his life back together, get his mind back again. They eventually married after about two years. And when Doug had got his mind back, he kept thinking about all of the homeless people that he'd met while he'd lived rough on the streets. And he decided he wanted to do something about it and he decided he would love to start a soup kitchen uh, for these homeless men. So he opened a bank account and uh, called it the soup kitchen account. And whenever he could get a double shift or extra overtime, he would do it and he would put that money into the account with this long-term vision that one day he would be able to start a soup kitchen for homeless men. 
And one morning he said to Elsie that uh, he was going to work a double shift that night to be able to put more funds into the account. And she said, Doug, I reckon you shouldn't work the double shift. I reckon instead you should go out on the streets and find one homeless man and bring him home for dinner because we've got one spare kitchen chair. You see, most of us are like what Doug was doing, which is that we establish a vision for what we want and then we spend the rest of our lives in means trying to get to that vision. Now, if I leave you with nothing else, it is this. You must live today like you want to live tomorrow. If you don't start living today like you want to live tomorrow, the chances are tomorrow will never ever arrive. Now that might sound a little cliche, but what you need to do is like Doug did, is invite one homeless man home for dinner and your future will grow. That's the seed from which your future will grow. The, your future will not grow from the bank account. The future will grow from you taking the future, finding a way to distill that into a seed. I often say to people, how much DNA of the future are in, is in your current actions? Look at what, where you're putting all of your energy at the moment. How much of the DNA of the future is actually in those actions? Uh, I'm the inventor of the walking school bus. I'm the greatest critic of the walking school bus because I didn't put enough of the DNA of the future into that invention. When I create a social in intervention now, I'm looking at it, trying to guess and, and, and look at how much of the DNA of the future is really inherent within the program that I'm creating, or is this purely a means to an end? So happy conference. I hope I've inspired you to think a little bit outside the box about what you do and what community gardens can achieve. Uh, they really should become places, um, that they should become uh, spaces in which people feel at home. Uh, in which we slow down enough and take our focus off of the future destination, reconnect with the infinite possibilities of the present moment. Uh, where we, when we put a seed in the ground, metaphorically that putting of the seed in the ground is the putting of a seed in the ground of the future that we want to create. Uh, and let's stop spending all of our energy going to meetings and, and uh, protest things. Sorry, I've got to tell you one more story. Uh, <laughs> I went to a conference once, which was very seminal for me. Uh, it was in Canada and this lady stood up and she got everybody in the room, and this is an exercise your, your group may choose to do. She got everybody to take a piece of paper and write on it what gave them most joy in life. And the second question was, what is your gift to the wider community? And then she went around and she just picked people at random, wrote it up on a whiteboard and then stood back and said, wow, nobody's put collecting petitions. <laughs> <laughs> nobody's put, and she named all of the things that we all try to do to change the world and none of it was on the list. And she put people into groups and said, you have to design an action which is based only on using what you've written on your piece of paper. Right. So as a group, if you're a gardening group, this is a great exercise. I extend this. Uh, when I do this kind of exercise with communities, I get them to write what junk they've got that they're willing to donate to change the world. We have some of the most fantastic projects we have done have come out of the junk that people are willing to give away. The, the, the key here is you must act within your sphere of influence and with the resources you already have. Most of us spend all of our time giving our power away saying we, the world will change when we convince somebody to do something or somebody standing in our way or we don't have the resources. Bunk them. You have every single thing you need to change the world you already have. What's lacking is a story that connects all of those pieces together. Make a story of how whatever assets you've got, you can combine to change the world. Am I already well over time?
you want to do each a little bit more? Just 30 seconds. 30 seconds? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Here's a powerful example of what I mean. Uh, I got into this business in 87 uh, when I headed up a, a fight against a freeway or a road widening in Brisbane. <coughs> this was in the days of Joe Bajelke Peterson. I don't know whether anybody you re remembers him. <laughs> I did a six hour door knock along the route. Every door I knocked on they said, once Joe's made up his mind to do something, there's nothing you're going to do to change it, Sonny. I went home. And I was outraged that our entire community was, this is the, if you were there yesterday, this is the meta story that our community was telling. And the meta story was creating a reality. Now, I didn't understand anything about meta stories in those days. I was as green as grass. I didn't have a clue what the hell I was doing. But I said to the group, let's convene and spend the day pretending we won. <laughs> and that we're at a reunion in 10 years' time to talk about how we won. We came together, we spent a day making up stories about how we won. We built our campaign on the most promising of those stories. Three years later we won, and it was according to the plot framework of the story we laid out three years earlier when we did that imaginary story. So you have to create a story in your mind of how you can change the world with the resources that you've got, with the gifts that you've been given. Uh, go out and do it. <laughs>